organized by the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park Authority. My name is Kate Lindley and I'm the Activities and Events Coordinator for the Park Authority. It is estimated by the British Astronomical Society that 90% of the UK population live under a heavy polluted sky and as such do not have a clear view of the stars. We are very fortunate here in Pembrokeshire as the National Park is one of the few places in the UK where the Milky Way is visible to the naked eye. With the low light pollution and a necklace of eight nationally recognized designated dark sky discovery sites, the National Park is one of the best stargazing places across the UK. Our dark skies and tranquility are some of the park's special qualities. If you have attended our events earlier this week, you will have learned important things about dark skies. Uh, for example, that they're important for humans and also for the wildlife. Recent research also highlighted the importance of the experience people get by looking at the night sky full of sky, full of stars. It often evokes deep emotional experiences, be it a sense of wonder, enjoyment, connection to nature or to community or to a place and can positively impact on our well-being. There are of course many stories and legends also associated with the starry skies going back thousands of years. And whilst our modern world, in our modern world, we rely on radio and satellite navigation systems, many of our ancestors used the night sky and stars to navigate. Quite possibly navigating by the stars is one of the oldest uses of astronomy. So to finish off our series of events to celebrate the International Dark Sky Week, we have teamed up with astronomer and founder of the Dark Sky Wells, Alan Trow, for a spot of virtual stargazing, as unfortunately it wasn't possible to organize a live event. But hopefully this evening's presentation will help you to think about the starry skies differently next time you look up the sky. Uh, as Alan mentioned, mentioned at the beginning, beginning, we will be taking question and answers. So pop them in the Q&A box um, and we will answer them after his presentation. So with, without further ado, Alan, over to you. Thanks, Kate. So welcome guys. And uh, just gonna share my screen with you all here now. Now, as you can see, oh, if I get rid of this one a little bit. There we go, that's better. All right, you don't want my ugly mug on there all the time. Right, uh, as you can see here, we're using some very, well, simple astronomical sky charts. It's a, it's a virtual planetarium software suite known as Celestron Sky Portal. And it's freely available to anybody who wants to download it on their phone, or their iPad, and it's um, uh, Android free and Apple free as well. So I should mention. So it is a very good tool to use to learn the sky. And what we've set up here is the evening, as if it wasn't cloudy and we had the nice clear skies, just off to the west as the sun was setting. Now this evening, around about quarter to nine. Now that we've gone into um, British summertime. Now, as you can see, the sun is still quite prominent, actually, uh, at this time of year, uh, just at, after sunset. And the light from the sun is actually scattering in our atmosphere, which gives us these wonderful sunsets and sunrises. But it also does help a little bit to have a little bit of the natural light pollution from the sun, because it allows us to spot the bright stars that come out first. And the brightest of them all is actually just tacked off here towards the southwest. And it's a star called Sirius. Now, Sirius's uh, common name is also called the dog star. And I'll show you why in a little moment. But Sirius is, is easy to spot. It is a very bright star, but it also appears like a kaleidoscope of colours when you view it in the sky. And that's because it's always relatively low in our atmosphere. It never gets massively high. And because it's low, you're actually looking through quite a dense part of the Earth's atmosphere, which causes this scattering of starlight. So it does come across as a multitude of different colors uh, as, as long as you look at it. But just off to its right, or a bit further west, I should say, is the constellation of Orion. And there are seven bright stars in Orion, which are easily recognizable. But the most recognizable of them all are his belt. And if we just move him to the center here, you can see the three bell stars there quite easily. And they're actually used as a bit of a guide. 
Now, Kate was on about navigation earlier on. Orion can be used for navigation, but it has to be a little bit darker, and I'll show you what it uh, does in a moment. But by using these three stars as a guide, you can go over to Sirius, but you can also go in the opposite direction. And it takes you to this little V shape of stars in the sky called the Hyades. And straight through them then, you'll end up at the Pleiades. Now these stars together are probably the oldest known configurations in the night sky. These have been found in cave paintings, which date back around about 30,000 years. And we don't know why they were there, but it does indicate that that Neolithic man was actually looking up at the night sky and studying it. Now, it's not just the presence of these kind of patterns in the sky or the constellations in the sky that were of particular interest to them, but it was also the passing of the moon because the Hyades are part of the constellation of Taurus, the bull. And you can see where that V-shape begins here. This is the red star known as Aldebaran, which is the bull's red eye. His face then comes down in this direction with his horns off to two points just here. Now, when we put the figures in, you can actually kind of see the shape of the bull quite clearly now. And Orion is facing the bull, but contained within his body is the, the little group of stars of the Seven Sisters, the Pleiades. Now, the cave paintings actually show Orion as a cross. So if you imagine going from Orion's shoulder here, this star called a Betelgeuse, and actually the word Betelgeuse, when you translate it into English, means armpit. And you can understand why when you look at its position. But if you go from Betelgeuse through the center belt star, which is a star called Alnilam, down then to his foot, which is a star called Rigel, and then do the same thing from Bellatrix, his right, sorry, his left shoulder through his belt again, down to Scythe, which is his knee, you get this wonderful cross shape. Now, drawn in the cave, you actually have this half bull. They haven't really bothered to put in the, the shape of the constellation. They've just drawn the bull itself. But near to the bull on the cave wall, they have six dark spots. And then these six dark spots really do represent the seven sisters. Now, we call them the seven sisters. There's actually only six you can see with the naked eye very well anyway, because one of them is a variable star and uh, disappears behind another every so often. But this constellation of Taurus sits on something known as the ecliptic. Now, the ecliptic is where, as a name implies, where eclipses occur. And these eclipses have to occur on this line. It's also, when you think of the name Taurus, the position where you find the constellations of the zodiac. Because here we have Aries, we keep going along, you've got Gemini, you've got Cancer, then you go up into Leo. So that position was quite important because this yellow line here represents the path that the sun appears to take through our sky. It's also where you find the moon, and it's also where you find the planets. Now, the planets and the moon will not sit directly on it all of the time. They actually wander a little bit above or a little bit below, so a maximum of about seven degrees. And just between the bull's horns here today, we, we do have a planet, and this one is Mars. Now, Mars, if you get the opportunity to go and have a look at it, it's worth having a little... Uh, glimpse with your own eyes first because Mars has faded quite significantly over the last 12 months as it recedes away from, from Earth. But if you were to look at it with a pair of binoculars, then unfortunately Mars is not going to look much better. It's still going to look like a red dot. It's only when you start to put telescopes onto the planet that you start to see any kind of detail. And still, even with relatively small telescopes, Mars isn't that impressive. It looks more like a, 
a rusty dot rather than anything else. It was only when we started to investigate it a lot more closely with uh, satellites and, and large space-based telescopes that we got to see a lot of detail on the planet. And in fact, a lot of the features on Mars were discovered by the Mariner spacecraft, which visited there back in the uh, 1970s. Now, some of the features on Mars are quite obvious with the polar capture, and even in a relatively small telescope, you can occasionally see the white little fleck on the, uh, the polar regions. But you'll also be able to spot little craters on it, you know, these dark features. You'll also find uh, the Valles Marianis, which was named after the, the spacecraft. And the Valles Marianis is, a, is essentially like the Grand Canyon on Mars, except it's the Grand Canyon on steroids because it's over 4,000 kilometers long and seven kilometers deep in places. You also get the largest mountain in the solar system called Olympus Mons, which is an extinct volcano. And Olympus Mons stands at roughly around 28 kilometers high. So it's a, a rather sizable structure. But Mars has a bit of a checkered history as far as uh, humanity is concerned, because Mars is the god of war. And many cultures around the world have always seen Mars as this warlike character, and probably due to the color of the planet itself. But when we move towards the uh, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, then we started to look at Mars with more powerful telescopes and with a little bit more imagination. And one man in particular, a man called Percival Lowell, decided that he was really going to have a good look at Mars, study the surface of the planet to see what he could discover. Now, Lowell was a businessman and he actually traveled the world and um, gained quite a, a wealth behind him. But his interest in Mars grew as he started to gather maps from around the world and started to compare them. And it was one map in particular which really caught his attention. And it was a map that was produced by Giovanni Schiaparelli, an Italian astronomer working in the Milan Observatory. And that actual map had dark lines which emanated from the poles and ended at the equator. Now, these lines were marked up as canali. Well, the Italian word canali means valley or channel, but the lower it meant canals. And if you had canals, then you had intelligent life on Mars. Now, if you had intelligent life on Mars, then what was that intelligent life going to do? Well, a lot of the professional astronomers of the day and the scientists of the day really did poo-poo his idea. But his idea was taken up by an English author. His name was H.G. Wells. And Wells went on to produce one of the most famous works of science fiction called War of the Worlds. And really the film and book of War of the Worlds inspired the future generations that now take us to the planets. Werner von Braun, the, the engineer behind the Saturn V rockets, was fascinated by the journey to Mars. The moon was just the, the side event. But that's easy to find in the night sky at the moment, and it's one that's well worth looking at. <coughs> Excuse me. But if we turn to the north for a moment, and when you look towards the north, most people think there is a bright star there that indicates where the North Star should be. But in reality, the North Star is quite a faint object to look at. And if you're in a built up area, for instance, then sometimes you can't even see it at all. So you need something to help you find it. Now, to help you find it, we look for a great bed in the sky. This is called Ursa Major. And at this time of year, Ursa Major is very close to the point directly above your head, known as the zenith. So if you looked up, you'd be able to spot the, the bear in the sky. Now, within the bear, there's another pattern of stars. And this pattern of stars is known as an asterism. And the asterism that we're looking at is known as the Big Dipper or the Plough, or if you're from South Wales, it is known as the saucepan. 
because there is the handle of the saucepan and that is the bowl. Now it's quite an easy one to spot because these several stars are relatively bright. And once you've found them, all you need to do is go to the end two here, which are known as the pointers, and then just draw a line across and you'll end up at the North Star Polaris. Now Polaris, as I mentioned, isn't that bright, but it is the brightest one in that region of the sky. So you're roughly going five times the distance between the gap of these two stars. So once you get over there, you'll spot it and you'll be able to find it quite clearly. But one of the problems with the star itself is that when you find it, it's part of something known as the Little Dipper. And you can see the Little Dipper quite clearly here. If I will zoom in, oops. I'm going a little bit hurry. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Let's try again. Right. Wonderful technology. There we go. Let's zoom right in. So if we go back out here, there we go. So when we look at the North Star there, just going to go back an hour and get rid of the pictures a second. <coughs> Excuse me. When you go back there, there it is, Polaris, right there in the center. These two stars and these two stars here are fairly faint. So sometimes you can just kind of miss where the little dipper is lying. So you want to look for this pair of stars here. Now they represent the end of that little bowl joining onto the handle of the little dipper. And once you've got it, then you've also found the little bear. Now these two bears are actually linked in mythology. And they're all to do with the, the god Zeus really and his many conquests. Now unfortunately this bear was a beautiful maiden called Callisto and Zeus had taken a shine to Callisto and had come down to earth and had his way with this fair maiden and unfortunately she fell pregnant. Now Zeus didn't want his wife Hera to find out so he decided that it was a good idea to turn Callisto into a bear and send her off into the forest. But when she gave birth, she gave birth to a human child. So Zeus returned to earth, took the child and gave it to another family for them to raise. Well, they raised this boy and they named him Arcas. Now Arcas grew up to be a fine young man and eventually he became a hunter. And one day whilst in the forests, he came across this rather large bear. Now this bear instantly recognised him as her son and she stood up on her hind legs, ready to give him a, a big hug. But unfortunately, it startled Arcas, and he pulled out his sword, ready to defend himself. Now, it was at this point that Zeus reappeared and explained the situation to Arcas. Now, Arcas wasn't happy and was getting quite annoyed. So at this point, Zeus thought it was another good idea to turn him into a bear as well. Now, this really upset the pair of them, and they became quite irate at the whole situation. So Zeus decided that the only solution to calm them down was to actually grab them by the very small tails at this point and to spin them around his head. And as he did so, the bears were quite heavy and the tails started to stretch. And they continued to stretch until he couldn't hold on any longer, and they flew off into the night sky. Once they were there, they were in full view of Callisto. And Callisto took a rather dim view of the whole situation. But instead of punishing Zeus, she decided to punish the bears. And she removed them into a place in the sky where they would never be able to touch the ground again. So they would never be able to drink from Earth's lakes. And to ensure that the bears stayed where they were, she placed this character in the sky. Now, this character was originally called Arcturus, the whole constellation. But in reality, 
Today, it's this star here, which we know as Arcturus. Sorry, guys, I'm going to get a drink. There we go. Now, Arcturus can be found quite easily towards the east in the sky at the moment. And all you have to do is return back to the saucepan or the dipper or, or, or um, plow, whichever you prefer to call it. Follow the handle and arc of the handle arcs down to Arcturus. Once found, Arcturus actually forms the base of sometimes uh, referred to as the ice cream cone or the kite. And it's a very easy thing to see in the sky. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, today, this constellation is called Butes. And Butes is accompanied by his dogs, Canis Venatasi. Now, in between them, in between the star LK here and the dogs themselves, is one of the most wonderful objects you can see with a, with a small telescope and actually with a pair of binoculars. It's called the Whirlpool Galaxy or M51. And it's easily located by just finding Alcade and taking your eye and oh, sorry, your binoculars and drifting along towards the stars of the dog. And when you do so, you will come across this wonderful object. <coughs> <coughs> oh, excuse me, guys. Now, M51 is known as the Whirlpool Galaxy. It was actually discovered by <clears throat> a guy called Charles Messier. Now, M designation in, in the catalog entry number just refers to Messier himself. But his catalog was put together because Messier was looking for comets. And as he was searching the heavens for comets, then these objects would appear and would catch his interest. And instead of moving like a comet would over a period of a number of days, these would actually stay stationary. And unfortunately, <coughs> excuse me, they were getting really on his, his nerves. So he started to make a catalogue of all these objects so that others who were searching would not have the same misfortune as himself. But what he'd actually stumbled across was two galaxies interacting. They're gravitationally bound together, and the larger one here is actually stripping material from the smaller galaxy there. And in a pair of binoculars, you will see these two cores as kind of fuzzy stars, quite easy to spot. And with a small telescope, anything of 100 millimeters or four inches or greater, you'll start to see some of the spiral structure appearing as well from a dark area. So it's one of those wonderful objects to go and have a little look at. <coughs> oh, excuse me. But we also have a number of other galaxies which are not that far away from the saucepan itself. And one of those is M81, or Bode's Nebula. So when you find the saucepan here, just in front of the saucepan, you actually have another two stars, oh, and then another one there, which forms a lovely triangle. Now, if you take the end star of the pointers and this star here, and just kind of form a natural triangle, you come across Bode's Nebula, or M81. And with it, you'll also spot M82. You have two galaxies together. Now, these two, again, are actually gravitationally bound, but they are quite separated too compared to M51. And these are about 12 and a half million light years away from us. So they are quite distant objects, but still relatively close compared to other galaxies that we see in the sky. <coughs> I do apologize. But if we go back over towards the east and Butes once again. Use Butes' shoulders this time and then just come across. So you're basically drawing a line on top of the ice cream cone, coming straight across, and you come into this horseshoe of stars. 
<coughs> excuse me. Now this is known as Corona Borealis or the Northern Crown. And then just sitting off to the side of the Northern Crown, we have the bright star Vega. Now Vega is the second brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere. And actually, um, I think it's the fifth brightest in the night sky. But sandwiched in between them, we have this wonderful constellation called Hercules. Now, Hercules will get better and better as the um, summer approaches. <coughs> it will be higher in the sky earlier in the evening. And once you get to see it, it's quite an easy one to remember because it, it is relatively simply drawn. So, for instance, when we look here, there is Vega. Here is Corona Borealis. And just to the side of it, we have a kind of a squashed square appearance. Now, that squashed square is known as the keystones or the body of Hercules. And if I just put the constellations back in with the shapes, you can see how his limbs then come off each corner. But Hercules is upside down and he's battling with a snake. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry about that, guys. And this snake is one of Hercules' labours. Another one of his labours is Leo the lion, what was known as the Nemean lion. We'll have a look at that one in a moment as well. <coughs> but the, the actual constellation has two wonderful globular clusters within it. Now, these globular clusters are known as M13 and M92. Now, to find M13... All you've got to do is go to the right-hand side of the keystones and go roughly two-thirds of the way up, and you'll be able to find it. Now, if you are fortunate enough and you're down in near the Pembrokeshire coast and you've got clear skies, then you will be able to see this one with the naked eye. But if you've got binoculars, then it becomes a very nice object indeed to look at. <coughs> Excuse me. Because when you look at it, what you're actually looking at is a very small area of space which contains upwards of a million stars. So it's a very densely packed area. And within that densely packed area, you get this bright, bright, coreish kind of feel about the object with this kind of firefly effect all around it. It's absolutely wonderful and well worth having a look at. And in relatively small telescopes, this is the kind of view that you will see. These individual stars flying around this very dense core area. Now, M92 is located just kind of, if you think of this as the Orion's midriff, and you draw a kind of triangular shape here again, then M92 can be discovered just in that triangle. <clears throat> and again, this is a rather large uh, large globular cluster. It is a little bit more distant than M13. And it can be seen to the naked eye, but you do have to have very pristine conditions to see it. But again, in binoculars and small telescopes, it's absolutely stunning. And these objects, these globular clusters, are found around the core of our galaxy. And as you look here, we can see the remnants of um, Cygnus set in, in the sky here. But as the night moves on, you'll see how the Milky Way begins to appear. So we're starting to get now to around about 2 a.m. in the morning. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see the location of M92 there, M13 this year. You have others like M4 down here in the constellation of Scorpius. They're all congregated around this galactic core. Now, what we think has happened with globular clusters is that globular clusters were once small galaxies or known as dwarf galaxies of their own, and they have been cannibalized by the Milky Way. So when you looked at M51 earlier, M51 itself is cannibalizing a small galaxy next to it. This kind of process is an evolutionary cycle of galaxies. But this is just the most wonderful part of the night sky. We now enter in um, 
probably the best time of year, really, if you if you like to see visual things in the sky. Now, it is difficult because the skies just don't get dark enough when you get past uh, the middle of May and into to June. But if you have a little bit of patience and you're an early riser, then April and early May can be very rewarding indeed because the Milky Way itself is stunning. And as you can see here across this um, southeasterly direction, this broad band of stars, because that's what we're looking at. We're looking at starlight, but that starlight itself, uh, is so, the stars are so distant to us that it's only the light coming together to form this cloudy appearance in the sky that we see. And if you're an astrophotographer or you're into photography in any way, then this is where you'd want to be taking a picture of the night sky because it's relatively easy to take photographs of. And we've got plenty of descriptions on how to do that on our Facebook page. But contained within it, we have numerous wonderful nebulae, and as I mentioned, star clusters, but also some very easily recognizable constellations. And if we start off here with Vega again, and just to the side of it, Hercules. You can see how Hercules and, and Vega are very, very close together. Now, Vega is part of the constellation of Lyra, which is kind of a Greek, Greek harp kind of uh, instrument. Now, the Lyra is then sitting above the swan in the sky. And if you start with this star Deneb, and you kind of work yourself down to this star here, which is known as Albiero, and then come off with a pair of wings. You have this wonderful cross in the sky, which represents the swan swimming down the Milky Way. And then towards the bottom of the picture, we have this bright star here again called Altair, with, which you can imagine is the, the beak of an eagle with his neck here and his outstretched wings. Kind of looks more like a pterodactyl, to be honest, but you've got to have quite a good imagination when you're an astronomer anyway to recognize these constellations. But these three stars form a right angle triangle, and they are known as the summer triangle. So once you can spot those, and they're quite visible in, in this part of the sky because they are bright, you can then frame the Milky Way running between it. And you just need to follow the direction of the swan then to take you down to the core. Now, our galaxy is best described as like being like two fried eggs placed back to back. <coughs> Excuse me. So you have this wonderful big yolk in the center, which is here, known as the nucleus or the core. And then the white, which is spreading out along both sides then becomes the spiral arms. And you can actually see where the spiral arms cross in front of the core here. And then with most fried eggs, you get a burnt part on the bottom. Well, those dark parts can then represent the dust lanes contained within our Milky Way. And all these dust lanes are really is areas where the dust and gas is so dense that the starlight just can't penetrate. And it's where you'll get new stars eventually forming in star clusters. <coughs> Excuse me. But when you bring the constellations in, you can start to see this wonderful constellation here. Now, this one, as you can see from the drawing, is called Scorpius. And contained within Scorpius, we have this really bright star known as Antares. Well, Antares, when you translate the name, actually means challenger to Mars. Because when you look at the color of it, you can see that it's very similar in appearance to the planet Mars. It's also where the ecliptic lies. Now, remember what I said earlier about the ecliptic? It's the path that the planets take as well across the sky. So every so often, Mars and Antares are in a very similar location in the sky. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is why it gets its name. But this constellation is actually linked directly to a winter constellation. And that's the one we've seen previously of Orion. Because as mythology goes, Orion was quite an arrogant individual. And he would often proclaim that he was such a great hunter that he could kill any living creature. Now, this upset the goddess Gaia. And Gaia actually 
cracked open the earth at one point and released a giant scorpion to go and kill and defeat Orion. Now those two battled for days on end and they fell down exhausted next to each other. And it was at that point that the scorpion thrust his tail out and stung Orion in his foot. And this is why the bright star Rigel sits at the base of Orion's foot. He killed Orion at that point, but Orion also thrust his sword into the scorpion, killing the scorpion too. Now the gods wanted to keep these two apart in the afterlife. So they placed them in opposite parts of the sky so they couldn't continue that battle any further. This is why when Orion is set in, Scorpion is in just rising. But Scorpius, to me, really represents summer. Because once you can see the scorpion in the sky, and in particular Antares, then you know that the Milky Way and its wonderful nebulae are not that far behind. And when you look into the nebulae here, you get a couple of really fantastic ones. Now, one in particular I like is known as the Triffid Nebula. <coughs> now, those of you of a certain age who have seen the day of the Triffids, it's supposed to represent the, uh, the flower or the Triffid's head. And um, it is quite a, a spectacular object to look at. But below it in the sky, we actually get the Lagoon Nebula as well. So you've got two wonderful nebulae very close together. Now, if you have um, those pristine skies that you get in Pembrokeshire, then you can actually spot these with a naked eye. But with a pair of monoculars, they look quite wonderful. Now, unfortunately, the human eye doesn't really do colour very well in the dark. And what you will see instead are grey patches <coughs> with an occasional greeny tinge to them. But put your camera on there and they will be revealed in all the glory. But as you make your way up the Milky Way, you'll start to see a few more of these wonderful nebulae. Now, the Amiga Nebula here is one point in case. Within it, and you've got to have a very good imagination here, you have this, which is known as the Swan Nebula. Now, the Swan Nebula <coughs> supposedly looks like a swan serenely um, swimming across a pond but it is a lovely patch of the sky and then above oh, excuse me you get the eagle nebula and within the eagle nebula you have something called the pillars of creation and they are quite famous because of the Hubble Space Telescope and you can see here these are those pillars and there are several light years in length and I'd like you to, to remind everyone, is 9.46 trillion kilometres, or roughly 5.8 trillion miles in distance. So you can imagine how large these objects actually are. And they star forming regions. <coughs> Excuse me. But one of the, the nice things about the Milky Way is actually not the brightness, it's the darkness. And in this part of the sky here, so pointing back towards Antares again, you actually get a dark nebula that looks very much like a horse, because there's the horse's head, there's his legs kind of extending down, his spine with his rear legs, and his tail. So it's a wonderful, wonderful part of the sky, and one you could really easily enjoy just by lying on the Pembrokeshire beach, looking up <clears throat> and out to out to the sea. Now, in particular, actually, I'm thinking about Pembrokeshire beaches. One of the nice ones to to observe from at this time of year is Broadhaven South, where you have Church Rock. And uh, we took a picture there a couple of years ago, actually, of the Milky Way in this orientation. So, um, yeah, it's it's a wonderful place to go and see it. And this weekend, well, if you if you're living in Pembrokeshire, it'd be worth going out and seeing. But move a little bit further now towards the south here. And uh, let's put some constellations back up for you. Because once you go back towards the south, 
we can start to follow those constellations of the zodiac back through. So there's Scorpius, here's Libra, here's Virgo. <coughs> Excuse me, going back into uh, Leo here. Now, Cancer just sits to the front of him here. And actually, Cancer as a constellation is a very faint constellation indeed. But you can find it by looking at Leo, because Leo has this very characteristic shape to it, where you have the head of the lion here moving down into his front leg. And this is a star called Regulus. And this whole little pattern is known as the backwards question mark or the sickle. And it's one of the easy asterisms in the sky to find. At his tail, we have another right angle triangle with the bright star Denebola, Cheshire. But when you look at Leo, Leo is facing towards Cancer. And then when you look towards Cancer, from a dark area, you'll see a kind of a, a patch of what well, glow. It looks like glowing gas to begin with. But this patch is actually a open cluster of stars called M44 or the uh, Beehive Cluster. Very easy to see. And once you found that, then you should be able to trace out the stars that make up the constellation of Cancer itself. But Leo was much bigger at one time. And his tail didn't just stop here. It actually extended up and took in this little tuft of stars here. But today, this tuft of stars, which is demarcated by this kind of L shape in the sky, is known as Coma Berenice, <coughs> excuse me, or Bernice's hair. And Coma Berenice is the only constellation in the sky named after a real person. And that was Queen, <coughs> excuse me, Bernice II, who was married to Ptolemy III. Now, Ptolemy III was the uh, instigator of, or the builder, I should say, with his father, Ptolemy II, of the uh, library at Alexandria. So they were very learned individuals. But unfortunately, he wasn't much of a warrior. And when he went off to uh, avenge his sister's death, his wife was particularly afraid that he wouldn't return. So she went to the temple of Aphrodite and offered up her wonderful golden hair as a sacrifice. So when he returned several weeks later, she was so pleased that she shaved off her locks, took them down to the temple and placed them on the altar. So when <coughs> the two of them went to visit the um, the temple the next day, the hair had disappeared. Now, unfortunately, Ptolemy wasn't quite uh, upset at this point and decided that he wanted answers. So it was down to the head priest of the time, a man called Conan, who came and explained that the, the goddess had been so uh, appreciative of the gesture that she'd actually taken the hair from the altar herself and placed it in the heavens, just here. Quick thinking, I think, rather than uh, having his head chopped off, he made up a lovely story. But we are quite fortunate today now, though, because in this area, we have something called our North Galactic Pole. So when you think of the... <coughs> oh, excuse me, again, I'm some guys, sorry. When you think of our galaxy, our galaxy has a North and a South Pole. This would be its East and its West plane here. So when you go up, that is where you find the North Pole of our galaxy. So when you look in this direction, so kind of like a big triangle between Virgo, Coma Berenice and Leo, when you look out in that direction, all you will ever see are multitudes of different galaxies. And if any of you remember back to the news last year, we had a picture of a black hole or the event horizon of a black hole. And this was part of the Virgo cluster. And you can see how many galaxies are now appearing here. This is known as Markarian's chain with M86 in the center of it. <coughs> but this galaxy here, the Virgo A galaxy, is known as M87. And this is where they took the picture. But all these galaxies that you see emerging around us, all these little fuzzy bits here, they're part of the Virgo cluster. 
which our Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy are also part of. And they're all found in that location. But to finish off our trip around the night sky, if we place the Milky Way just off to the side there, and we move the time forward to just before dawn, you will get to see two lovely planets just as the sun is rising. They're not at their best just yet. That, that doesn't come until we get into August, really. But here we have Jupiter and Saturn, two wonderful gas giants. <coughs> and with Saturn in particular, you can see the rings going around this planet, which is essentially debris left over from the, the close approach of a moon which got destroyed with a small telescope. With binoculars, it's not that easy because unfortunately the binoculars kind of just elongate the, the, the look of the planet to make it look like a cigar shape. But with a small telescope, this is the kind of view that you would expect to see. The rings lovely and open. If you've got wonderful viewing conditions, you'll actually see this dark line here, which is known as the uh, Cassini division. It was found by Giovanni Cassini. And also bands on its surface, which are just weather systems. But Jupiter is the one that you can really go to town with, with a small pair of binoculars. Because with Jupiter, if you've got a, a nice steady platform, so taking your binoculars and resting um, on a wall or a car, or even just leaning back uh, with a broomstick up to, upturned, resting your elbows on it, you'll be able to see its moons. <coughs> and the four moons that you will see are known as the Galilean satellites. They have names of Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. But a small telescope will reveal the, the wonderful banding on the planet, especially these two, which are known as the equatorial bands. And if you're lucky, you'll get to see the great red spot as well. Now, the great red spot is a storm that's been raging for the last 350 years that we know of. But it may well have been there for much, much, much longer. So I hope you've enjoyed that look around the sky, guys. And I do apologize for the, the constant coughing. As I was telling Kate earlier on, you know, at the start today. But if you've got any questions, then please just fire them out. I'll just have a look here. Thank you, Alan, and and thank you getting through <laughs> through oh, the presentation. <laughs> it's driving me mad. <laughs> no, it's, it's been really good. Um, fascinating, fast, really fascinating um, subjects, and I've learned so much. Um, We've got a, a sort of a couple of questions. I think, what was the name of the app you mentioned? Right, the app that we're using, Adrian, and, and others, it's called Celestron Sky Portal. And I'll put that into the chat here for you. <coughs> As I said, it's free, re, f, uh, freely available, and um, it's well worth... Uh, Invest in a couple of minutes to download it because it, it'll be invaluable when you get outside. Anybody think, ask for a question, guys? I think oh, uh, there's another one coming in. What is the minimum size of telescope you'd recommend getting to get a look, good look at the stars? Right. Personally, um, I wouldn't buy a telescope as a first jump into astronomy. Um, the, the main reason being, when you go from using your own eyes to a, a telescope, you go from a few thousand stars that you can see all the way up to several million with a telescope. So you get lost a little bit um, while you're looking for things. So you need an intermediary. And that would be a pair of 10 by 50 binoculars. That gives you a, a, a basic knowledge then of the, the night sky before moving on to the, the bigger telescopes. And uh, hopefully you won't get too immersed in too many stars all at once. <clears throat> but if you feel confident enough that you want to go for it, then there, there's a number of different options you can you can go for. But the most popular one, I would say, would be to go for something like a six-inch Dobsonian telescope, or a 150-millimeter Dobsonian telescope. 
they're very cheap to buy and they uh, they will give you a lot of light gathering capability and you'll see lots and lots of galaxies and nebulae and, and planets very easily with them. Yeah, oh, David just mentioned about that, 10 by 50s. Say. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a pair pairs that we use as a company called Olympus DP ones. And every now and again, if you go on Amazon, they'll be on sale and you can pick them up for about 50 pounds. No, so you can't damage your eyes by looking at the night sky with binoculars. The only time you can ever damage your eyes with binoculars is if you looked at an extremely bright light source, which would be the sun or a lighthouse, for instance. <coughs> I might guess I will try and get the transcript um, posted for you. Um, it, I'll probably prob have to put it up on our Facebook page at some point. Um, or if you want to drop me a message, uh, I'll give you actually I'll put my email address in, in the chat here. There we go. So if you want to get in touch with me on chat, I'll be able to send you the transcript later on. Uh, they're asking also about the Facebook page, uh, Alan. Right, so it's at Dark Sky Wheels, guys. I'll put that one in as well. And would you recommend any other apps that people <coughs> have on their phones when they're looking at the night sky? To be honest with you, the Celestron one does it all. Um, the only other thing you really got to bear in mind with is the weather, because obviously there's not much point planning an observing trip if you're going to go out and it's cloudy. So possibly um, something like Clear Outside, which is uh, uh, an app that was developed by, yep, someone's already put it out there, yeah. <clears throat> which is uh, an app that was developed by First Light Optics, a company down in uh, Exeter. Now, it is a little bit hit or miss, so you do have to do a bit of comparison between that and your local forecasts, but it's generally not too bad. Now, Gordon's asking about the stargazing. Well, you've got your eight designated dark sky discovery areas, which you'll find on the uh, Pembrokeshire website, uh, Gordon. But to me... Some of the best areas are, are down near Stackpole. Uh, I know Stackpole is a dark sky discovery site, but go down that area, you get some lovely views across the, the sea to the coast. Another one is St. David's. It, uh, we actually got a fantastic picture there a couple of years ago of the um, St. Justinian's light boat. There we are. I'll try and share it with you now, guys, so you can see it. All right. I have a couple of questions. How is Here a black go. hole created and where would you go from Narbeth? <coughs> well, excuse me. Sorry, can you say that again then, Kate? Sorry, I missed yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah, we can see the, the image. Is, it's lovely. So, yeah, it is St. Justin in... Yeah, that's St. Justin. Yeah, it's down um, St. David's St. way. David. Well, you, are, you said it was a couple of questions I missed. I, I do apologise. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, uh, where would you go from Narbeth? Um, well, if you go to Narbeth, you, you're close enough to Broadhaven South to have a look down that way. Uh, it's just not that far from Tembe, really. But even down on Tembe, down on the beaches, as long as you're looking out towards the coast, you'll see quite a bit. Um, uh, what time of night was the photo taken? This one was actually taken during the end of July in 2018. So we had quite a, quite a nice evening that night. And um, it is it is a fabulous place to go to observe the Milky Way. August is actually one of the best times to go down this area uh, because you have a meteor shower called the Perseids, which will be um, around about August the 12th going into the 13th. We've actually got the Lyrids now in April, which is on the 22nd, 23rd of this month. But unfortunately, the moon is going to be playing a little bit of havoc with us. Um, so um, you just have to be quite wary of choosing your times to go out. Yeah. Um, so how far is the Leo constellation from the Earth? That's another question. Well, if we go back, if I share the screen once again, yeah. What have I done with that now? Here we go. So the galaxies in Leo uh, can be up to 65 million light years away from us. So they are quite quite a distance from us. 
<coughs> excuse me. Mm. Anyone want to cough? <laughs> so when we go back to Leo here, for instance, there's a lovely uh, cluster actually called M6566. And in that cluster, <coughs> which just falls below the, the, the bottom of the triangle there, when you, when you look at these galaxies, you see the triplet? So there's M6566. And that was an NGC number I can never remember. But basically, <coughs> oh, excuse me, guys. But basically, when you're looking at these things, you're looking back quite a distance now. <coughs> excuse me. So M65 here is roughly 35 million light years away. So they're not next door neighbors anymore. They are quite distant. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, there's a couple of questions about where in Pembrokeshire you'd recommend and have you tried Bulk Gwent? If I could just run through the eight dark sky uh, yeah. discovery sites because uh, they are accessible, um, you know, for, for everyone to go and, uh, and enjoy stargazing. So the, the, the eight sites are Poppet, Sichpant, uh, Newgale, Keat, Broadhaven South, Sprinklehaven, Martins Haven, and Garnbauer. And they all can be found on the Pembrokeshire Coast National Park website. Another nice one to visit, actually, is Pentra Run as well. Now, I know it's limited space for parking up there, but it's this wonderful spot to get a good broad view of the Milky Way and the surrounding area. <coughs> Excuse me. Have, have the Starlink satellites satellites caused you any problems? Simple answer is yes, they're an absolute nuisance. They um, continually cross in the sky and he's launching more and more every single day, it, it seems. Now, from a, a visual point of view, they're not too bad because you can just kind of try to ignore them. But when you're, you're photographing the night sky, you know, it's a bit of potluck. You've got to try to time your images between satellite passing, which is very, very difficult. And it's only going to get worse, John, unfortunately. he's um, He's got 42,000 scheduled to be launched in the next five years. Mm. It's terrible. It is. Um, uh, I've got one question from Susie. She's asking, she's been recommended to buy a Mead ETX 80 Observer, but there are none for a sale in the UK. Would you, can you recommend something similar, please? Unfortunately, Susie, you're going to be struggling to get any kind of telescopes at the moment. Um, there's been a massive shortage during the lockdown because I think everyone has gone out and bought themselves a telescope. But with the ETX-80, it's really a small refracting telescope. So um, anything along the Skywatcher or Celestron range would do you very well. Um, the ETX-80 is also, I believe, got a go-to system attached to it. So again, I... I know there's sky watchers coming in at the end of this month, so I'd probably go for a sky watcher version instead. Someone's asking about a black hole. Yes, there was a question. Could you could a black hole appear close to our galaxy? Um, it was actually a supermassive black hole in the centre of our galaxy. So this is t hundreds of billions of times the size of our sun. So the big objects already here, um, but we also get stellar black holes where large stars which are anywhere up to 10 times or in greater than 10 times the mass of our sun will die and they can form black holes as well so black holes are everywhere that we look in space at the moment should be should we be worried about black holes no no definitely not is we're not going to get close enough to one to to cause us any problems i think that just, yeah i think i think we've answered all the questions. Uh, I'm just double checking. There were a couple of nice comments um, from people. A uh, lot of thanks. You, thank, oh, there's one now. Um, when looking at astrophotography, are there particular settings needed? All right, John, for astrophotography, yes, there, there's going to be. Um, you, you really need a, a DSLR for a start. So um, we use Canons here, but there's Nikons and Sonys and all sorts you can use these days. Um, it's best to use a prime lens if you've got one, so something like a 14 millimeter lens. But if you haven't, then you can use the, the stock uh, lens that comes with the camera. 
but do you want to open it up as wide as you can? So the stock lenses tend to be 18 to 55, something along those region, those numbers. So if you open it up to 18 and then focus to infinity or focus on a brightest star that you can see, and then just don't touch your focus at all after that. So make it manual. Then put your camera into manual mode. Set it in for 20 second exposure. That's something like an ISO 3200 or 6400. And then just leave it go. And you should get some quite reasonable results. We've also, like I said, if you go on our Facebook page, there's always a little um, descriptions on how we're taking the pictures as well on there. So you can pick up some tips from that. Thank you. Thank you for answering all the, those questions, Alan. That's think, okay. Yeah, we've had some lovely, lovely comments. Um, you know, this has been really interesting and inspiring. I've loved all the histories and stories. Thank you so much. Um, thanks. That was brilliant. Yeah, lovely, lovely comments. Uh, so I'm very, very pleased for how this evening has gone. I don't think we've got any more questions. So no, maybe we should great. draw it to the close. Um, there's a nice one from Danny. Uh, thank you for a fabulous presentation. Can't wait to be back in Pembrokeshire. Hope your cough is better soon. <laughs> oh, okay. It's only, it's only started today. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, better get a test. I hope. I hope not. <laughs> oh, I've already, I've already had COVID at the beginning of 2020, so I, I definitely am glad. Yes. Yeah, so a lot of, lot of lovely, lovely comments. So, uh, <laughs> On behalf of the National Park Authority, Alan, thank you very much for this lovely um, presentation. It's been really inspiring, and I hope, you know, seeing by the comments as well that people very much enjoyed it. Um, so, everyone, thank you for joining us here tonight, and I bid you all good night. Nostar. Nostar, everyone. Nostar.